Resuming debate. The Honourable Member from Thornhill. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, news broke today of another terrorist attack in Tel Aviv. Uh, more than 200 missiles launched into Israel from Iran, with sirens sounding in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. In every major city across the country, as nearly an entire population took shelter in place. There is no better time than tonight to talk about the brutality of the Iranian regime, the most destabilizing force of evil in a region, and the puppet masters for the proxy armies who have wreaked havoc on millions of innocent people in Gaza, in Lebanon, in Iran, and of course in Israel. The attack appears far bigger than the last one in April, and it should be the clearest of indications that Western values, that peace and security, that the stability of the entire region are all at risk because of the fundamentalists that have for a generation taken Iran back into the Stone Ages. And over the last number of weeks, they were deeply wounded, they were humiliated, and they were finally weakened. And it should have been very simple to state unequivocally that Israel, especially on a day where millions were forced into shelters and innocent civilians were killed in a terrorist attack, that it had the right, the duty, and the responsibility to defend itself. It should be easy to, un to unequivocally state that this country should fight to eradicate terror. And instead, we got this from a foreign minister who's not just naive about terror, but outside of her depth on almost every conversation since and before October 7th. And quite frankly, it's humiliating for her and it's humiliating for the entire country. So instead of a, a comment on fighting terror, her words were the following. I'm going to quote, the attacks from Iran will only serve to further escalate the region and therefore, that is why I have been in contact with my Israeli counterpart this morning, and I have been in contact with G7 foreign ministers, as well as Arab countries foreign ministers. This is a very dangerous time for the Middle East, and we need to make sure that the war stops. That was her quote. She went on to tell reporters outside of this place, quote, I need to make sure that there is no escalation, of course. Israel needs to be able to protect itself, and that's what we will continue to support its, its security, and will support, of course, through the Iron Dome. She continued her quote, at the same time, we need to make sure that parties sit down and the war stops because we can see what will happen. There will be even further escalation, more further innocent civilians, including women and children, die. And that's what I said at the UN yesterday, and we need the war to stop, end quote. So if we are to understand this, the minister's position now is that Israel can intercept hundreds of incoming ballistic missiles from Iran, but that's exactly where the defense stops. Israel just needs to accept that these attacks happen and that they are, their technological superiority can continue to provide 100 percent coverage. Unconcerned with the terror of Hamas and Hezbollah and the mullahs in Iran, and only capable of repeating these talking points, They've received high praise from some in her caucus. They've received confusion from others, embarrassment from some. And they were thanked. This, this, this minister was thanked by Hamas, a terrorist organization, that this country was once unequivocal about wanting to defeat. We went on to talk again about a ceasefire on the day of a major escalation from Tehran. And as for her calls for the supposed 21-day ceasefire, the G7 and some Arab countries were touting last week, it is worthwhile to remember, because nobody has said it in this House, that that ceasefire negotiation didn't include any of the belligerent actors involved in this, the ones responsible for the ongoing terror attacks. They themselves were not in the ceasefire talks. So it was a ceasefire proposal that didn't involve anyone who was actually fighting. This is, the main, this is the minister who at the UN managed to offend even our most ardent allies in Canada with her inconsistent hum of moral equivalency, her incomprehensible message, and the very fact that Canada at the highest levels speaks from both sides of its mouth. It is the same minister who, alongside the Minister for Mental Health and the member from York Centre, was proudly photographed 
caressing the hand of a prolific terrorist and a Holocaust denier in the 19th year of his four-year mandate who set up a martyr fund to reward those who killed Jews. The member from York Centre demanded an apology from members of this House, and I will tell you, Mr. Speaker, she will never get an apology from any member of this House on this side for pointing to her dangerous, sanctimonious hypocrisy as she poses for pictures with terrorists instead of denouncing terror. I think her constituents actually deserve the apology, and I am almost certain that there is no apology that will ever convince anyone from her riding to make her a member of parliament again. The Prime Minister came to Jewish communities after October 7th. We are almost a year from that date. He and members of the Liberal Party stood tall and promised full support. He gave them their word. But what have we seen since? We've seen protests targeting innocent people in Jewish neighbourhoods, Jewish businesses, Jewish places of worship. They're not protesting Israel. They're not protesting the government of Israel. They're not even protesting MP offices. They are intimidating Jews, complete with anti-Semitic slogans, with flags, with chants, with banners, in neighborhoods, in front of synagogues, in front of a senior's home right here in the nation's capital just last week with silence from the MP. We've seen new lows in cancel culture as Israeli authors and artists themselves are deplatformed, as universities call for ideological purity to promote Hamas talking points, as IDF veterans are shamed And as the leader of one of Ontario's largest unions gets to keep his job while celebrating, quote, resistance in the Middle East. We all know what that means. His watermelon army of radicals enjoys impunity of the worst anti-Semitism that I have seen in my lifetime in any labour movement. And we have seen unprecedented acts of physical violence too, at synagogues, at schools in Toronto, synagogues and schools in Montreal, cities from coast to coast, like Vancouver to Fredericton. It goes beyond graffiti that we have all, unfortunately, gotten used to. It turned into firebombs. It turned into bricks through buildings. It turned into actual gunshots from actual guns. But where has the Prime Minister gone? As as the headlines pile up, one after another, as stories get more and more outrageous, nothing except silence, and maybe, if we're lucky, the weakest of platitudes trying to say something and nothing at all. All while anti-Semitic hate crimes doubled in less than a year. It's 2024, they are up by 250%. All while the Jewish community suffered 70% of all religious-based hate crimes, despite making up less than 2% of the population. The Prime Minister is nowhere to be found. His Foreign Minister can't muster a coherent thought. His Ministers are terrified of even giving the most basic condemnation. That's on him. He and his government lack the courage to speak out unequivocally and denounce what is happening right now. And the lack of courage to take new measures to protect our country by truly banning the IRGC agents, whom are still here, Sammy Dune, and even properly vetting those who have been caught right before they committed a terrorist attack, either right here in our country's biggest city or south of of the border in New York. The government awarded a citizenship to someone that they arrested on terror charges. They lack the courage to do just the bare minimum, and enforcing the laws in our, as enforcing the laws in our criminal code, they all, while they deny security funding to the most vulnerable synagogues or community centres with excuses of red tape or, frankly, incompetence. We've known for a long time that the Prime Ministers and his MP lack any conviction at all. But never has this lack of conviction been more costly and poor, put more people at risk than right now. He's playing politics because he's out of gas on everything else. He's playing politics with the gravest threat in the Middle East, in the Middle East's security in a generation. And he's playing politics with the biggest challenge to Canadian religious freedoms since the Holocaust. And let me tell you how he does it. 
He sends one group of MPs to say one thing to one community, and he sends another group of MPs to say another thing to the other community. He gets members like the one from Mount Royal and Eglinton Lawrence to put out strongly worded tweets to say all of the right things to try and cover up the failures at the top while being shoved in the back corner of Parliament. Meanwhile, members like the one from Scarborough Centre call for a, quote, unequivocal embargo and actively parrot anti-Israel talking points. Two different MPs, two different messages to two different communities. He sends ministers to denounce UNRWA and announce that they stopped Canadian funding. But then they quietly resume funding just months later with millions of tax dollars. They can't even take a stand to condemn the immunity for UNRWA employees that participated in literal terrorism. And let's not forget their impeccable timing to reaffirm their unwavering support for UNRWA, just as UNRWA publicly admitted that Fatih al-Sharif, Hamas leader in Lebanon, was also running an UNRWA school and heading their school union. He was just buried in Hamas regalia, in case anyone missed it. And at what point does the Liberal government move UNRWA from the willful ignorance column to the willing co-conspirator column and stop sending Canadian tax dollars that, are, that is funding terror? They are doing so because they lack the courage. Like I said, they lack the conviction to do what's right instead of do what's popular. They lack the fortitude to stand with our allies through fire and through water instead of just freeloading as usual. And they lack the moral clarity to stand with the Jewish community, not just when it's easy, but also when it's difficult. There is a steep price to pay for this, Mr. Speaker, for our reputation abroad as it continues to crumble in the face of another equivocation, in the face of another reversal, in the face of another backtrack. We once, took, we once were the country that took Juno Beach, that served in Korea, that brought peace to countless nations. We were the country now that can't even honor its basic commitments. Send a foreign minister who has a basic understanding of the threats in the region to any podium where those in the audience aren't questioning her own capacity and the words coming out of her own mouth. It is a steep price to pay for those living in the Middle East as they continue to live under the thumb of oppressive regimes like Hamas and like Hezbollah, as they continue to wait for their loved ones to come home, and as they continue to yearn for peace and freedom. But it's also a steep price to pay for the people living here in Canada. And it hasn't been this hard to be a Jewish Canadian for a very long time. How couldn't it be when you can't hang a mezuzah on your door at your home or at your university dorm? And frankly, in almost every Jewish neighborhood, that's happening. How couldn't it be when you can't wear a kippah without being followed or verbally harassed or even spat on in this country? How couldn't it be when you go to synagogue and you find out again that it's been vandalized? And how couldn't it be when you send your kids to a Jewish school and you can't trust that they are going to come home at the end of the day? But these are not just attacks against the Jewish community. They are attacks against everyone. And when the inherent rights of religious freedom, of speech, of assembly, or just plain dignity are denied to one group, it is very easy for people to deny them to another group. And when we turn a blind eye to injustice happening here at home, they persist, and it gets worse. My parents came to this country for freedom, and I am so glad that they did, and millions of others came to this country for freedom. But I wonder if they saw the anti-Semitism here today that they would make that same decision, because it's been taking place in this country for far too long. And it's not hyperbole. It's a real thing that's happening. And the other side better wake up. Yeah. The emails I get from constituents telling me, I want to stay in Canada, but I don't know if I can anymore. They tell me that freedom, the very essence of our country, is in great peril, and they're actually scared in 2024 as Jews in this country. And when we lose that, Mr. Speaker, 
we lose something much bigger than ourselves. It's not too late to get it back, but it's going to take far more effort than the window dressing and think of the posturing that this government put forward so far. But since the members of the NDP have become unrecognizable in their pursuit of division in this country and the last lack the respect for Western democratic values, unable to muster even the courage to stand on the side of allies, brought a request to discuss the carnage in Lebanon without, with barely a mention of Hezbollah. Let's go through a timeline so they can join us here in the real world. October 7th, that's Hamas's attack on Israel, the worst attack on the Jewish people since the Holocaust. Hezbollah immediately escalated that aggression, launching more than 9,000 missiles, rockets, and drones on northern Israel. It has been evacuated for all, the better part of a year. After doing the bidding of these terrorists, July 27, 2024, an attack on Druze children by Hezbollah occurred in the northern Golan Heights. A rocket fired by Hezbollah struck a soccer field where children were paying. They killed 12 children, teenagers. They, they, they injured dozens more. So now in response to these attacks, Israel has launched the largest military campaign against Hezbollah since 2006. The operation targets Hezbollah's military infrastructure, aiming to significantly degrade the group's capabilities. And we used to be on the side of fighting terrorism. And in this part of the house, we still are. Yeah. And that brings us to the elimination of one of the most prolific terrorists that ever was, ending a 30-year reign of terror when he dragged his country into one war after another, indiscriminate in his terror, Israelis, Americans, the death of thousands of Lebanese, of Syrians during his bloody rule, and he enjoyed very little support from his Arab neighbors and the Arab League and the U.S. and the EU and Canada, who designated him a terrorist, his group a terrorist. So to watch these flags fly in the streets without a peep from anybody in this House is frankly unforgivable. To watch members of this House stand in rallies alongside Hezbollah flags is unforgivable. No one wants to see the loss of life, Mr. Speaker. It's why we're here talking about this anywhere. But it must be said in this debate that the rulers of Hamas, of Hezbollah, and the tyrants in Tehran are the cornerstone of suffering, and they must come to an end. The people of Lebanon, the people suffering in Gaza, the hostages still in the grips of the barbaric terror, the brave Iranian people who have taken to the streets to weaken their regime, they should be the people that we seek to fight for. This regime is responsible for stoning women in soccer fields, for throwing gay people off of roofs, and to watch members of parliament line up at rallies where they are flying their flag, again, Mr. Speaker, is frankly unforgivable. We shouldn't be a focus on appeasing the tyrants, not here and not anywhere. The dictators, the murderers, the forces of hatred in power in the Middle East, we shouldn't be worried about placating the violent, spiteful mob. But that is what this country has become. And that is what we are doing right now. And Mr. Speaker, it is a shame. And it will change the day we elect the member from Carleton as the next prime minister of this country. Yeah. yeah. Questions and comments. Terry to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the member for Thornhill can have her own version of the truth, but she can't change the truth. Here, here. And earlier tonight, she tweeted something that took a clip out of what the Minister of Foreign Affairs had said at a press conference and cut it off at only a few seconds. It was a shameful act of misinformation and disinformation. The minister did call for de-escalation in, in this situation, as Canadians have all called for, but she also said, and immediately thereafter, and I quote, we support Israel's right to protect itself against these attacks. Why did she cut that part to try to foster division in this country when we're supposed to heal this country? The Honourable Member from Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, there is not one person on that side of the House that can explain to me what they mean by Israel's self-defence. What does it mean when they say Israel can defend itself? This is the same party that has cut off the, cut off military, uh, military aid to Israel and military aid... Come on, Mr. Speaker. He had his turn. 
cut off military aid to the Iron Dome. So does it stop there? Does Israel get to defend itself in using the Iron Dome and it stops there? The, the foreign minister can't answer that question. Nobody on the other side can answer that question. And as soon as they do, I'm sure Canadians can know the truth. Again, I'd like to remind all members not to take the floor until they are recognized to do so. It is a way so that we can ensure that we have a maximum participation by members and also have pointed, passionate, but in the end, parliamentary debates. Uh, the Honourable Member for Santiago saint -Bagot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I listened attentively to the speech by my colleague. I think we're all on the same page. I don't think anyone wants to be, uh, show solidarity with uh, dictators. On the contrary, and yet despite this, I have difficulty understanding how when a conservative government gets in, things will change. We want to be stand in solidarity with the people. Back uh, in the day, the U.S. government was ruled by neoconservatives, led by George W. Bush. They wanted to install democracy around the world by force, and it led to catastrophic results in Iraq. So what does uh, my honorable colleague propose concretely? The people in the region, the people of Lebanon, the people of Syria, those who have taken to the streets in Iran, not only for the last two years since the death of Masa Amini, but for the last 45 as the fundamentalists have ruined that country and taken yeah. them back in the Stone Ages, they're the ones who want change. And to watch members of this House, to watch members of the government apologize for the tyrants and the terrorists and the murderers is frankly beyond this country. And it's shocking. The Honourable Member from Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, the, the member's speech referred to an awful lot of the anti-Semitism we are seeing across this country, and that is that is undoubtedly true, and it is it is something that I think every member of this House is is appalled by. And we should be doing everything we can to limit all anti-Semitism, anti-Palestinian racism anti-Islamophobia, all sorts of the discrimination that we are seeing um, increase ex exponentially right now. However, I have to say, I was in this House when a member of the Conservative Party used Hezbollah slurs, talked of pagers, when, when addressing an Israeli-Canadian member of Parliament. If that isn't anti-Semitism, if that isn't if that is an appalling behaviour from the Conservative Party, I wonder if this member would find that appropriate if that had been directed at another member of this House of Commons. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Speaker, we talked about the anti-Semitism. We've talked about the attacks on churches, on mosques, on gurdwaras. We, talked about, we talk about in this House that it doesn't matter when you came to this country what language you speak, what colour your skin is, there is no room for this. There is no room for the hatred. And we want that application to, to, to ensure that Jews are part of that, that the Jews are part of that story, that Jews are part of that denunciation of hate. And so far, we've seen none of that from the government and none of that from anywhere else. And you don't have to ask me, I represent one of the largest Jewish constituencies, but I've become a voice for the many in this country that email me every single day terrified of living in this country. And it's because the actions of this government and the coalition partner that are driving division in this country that that is happening. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for King Vaughan. Thank God. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Thornhill is among, amongst, among the fiercest of voices in the Jewish communities. After hundreds of ballistic missiles terrorized millions of Israels today, how has this impacted Jewish life in Canada? For Thornhill. Madam Speaker, I think the impacts were 
clearly laid out in my speech. And as we approach the anniversary of October 7th, I think you will hear from a chorus of voices, Jewish and non-Jewish, who cannot believe what has happened in their country. Canadians who love this country, but don't recognize it anymore. And it is because of the divisive rhetoric and the tens of, tens of positions that this government has taken, saying one thing to one community and another thing to another, that this is actually happening. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Jean. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a lot of respect for uh, my Conservative colleague. We have worked together on a few different files. We have worked uh, side by side. But right now, there is an emergency debate, and there might be people in Lebanon who are waiting for a solution. They might be worrying about le having to leave their country because they're worried for their, their children, their wife, their husband, their, their parents, maybe their Canadian citizens. Should we not leave partisanship aside for one night and uh, propose constructive solutions for people who are listening to us, worrying about uh, having to leave Lebanon due to a fatal armed conflict? Member for Thornhill. As the government uh, indicated that uh, those who uh, are in Lebanon, uh, Canadian citizens, should seek an immediate way out. Um, but I'm not sure that you've heard any solutions uh, from the government beyond that. But I suspect the member can ask the government when they have their next round of speeches. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Jean. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We may not have answers from the government, because I did ask that question to the government and I didn't really get satisfactory answers. But I understand that my colleague is someone who likes to propose constructive solutions, so I'm wondering whether she has anything she can propose to help people who currently need help right now. They're the very reason we are having an emergency debate. So I'd like to ask whether my colleague has answers to provide these people. As I said, the Canadian citizens should leave Lebanon now, but I can offer solutions to what the government could and should have done since October 7th. They should, they sh they should have listed six years ago the IRGC for the terrorists that they are. And they should ensure that every single one of those terrorists are sent out of this country. We know that there are 700 here that still roam around our communities. And after the incursions into Israel today, no, at no time in history is that more important to show Iranian Canadians and those fighting in the streets for freedom in Lebanon that they are on the side of freedom against tyranny. There is no time in history where the government uh, should take this more seriously. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank my colleague for her excellent speech. She made one observation that I want to take particular note of, and that is about uh, the constant mixed messages that we have from this government. She spoke about different members bringing different messages to different communities. It's worse than that. We have, we have ministers, parliamentary secretaries, giving contradictory explanations of the conflict here in this House even tonight. Uh, it, it's clear that the government can't actually get a handle on taking any consistent position or defining the positions that they've taken. They're simply trying to have a kind of management of diversity of opinion on this without reference to any uh, clear principles. Uh, and I wonder if the member can reflect on what that does for Canada's credibility when the government of Canada is literally taking contradictory positions in the course of, of tonight's debate and, and in general. Very brief answer from the Honourable Member for Thornhill. Well, Madam Speaker, I think that the government has taken contradictory positions since the beginning of this. It started on October 9th when the Prime Minister came and stood with the Jewish community saying all of the right things. He sends one group of MPs into synagogues, into community centres to say all of the right things about how they support one side of this conflict. And then they send another group of MPs into mosques, and into other locations with other communities to say the exact opposite. It is not, a, it is not an issue of principle. It, it is an issue of policy. have to resume debate. Uh, the